June of 1976, a fight was held in Tokyo, Japan that was hailed the War of the Worlds. It was between the undisputed heavyweight world champion of the world, Muhammad Ali, and the Japanese National Wrestling Federation champion, Antonio Inoki. All told, the War of the Worlds lasted 15 rounds. It had a worldwide audience of 1.4 billion viewers. The match spawned mixed martial arts as a sport, and the WWE would later call it MMA's first big fight. The match was also incredibly dangerous, and the physical beatings that Muhammad Ali took nearly cost him his boxing career. He suffered two blood clots and an infection in his left leg, which led his doctors to consider amputation. And yet, I bet many of you have never heard of the War of the Worlds fight. If you're a casual fan of Muhammad Ali or of boxing in general, you'll remember fights like the Thrill of Manila against Frazier, the Rumble in the Jungle against Foreman, or Ali's most famous loss against Frazier in Madison Square Gardens, which ended his 31-fight winning streak, dubbed the fight of the century. But nobody talks about the match that Ali fought to a draw against a Japanese wrestler. A wrestler who spent 15 grueling rounds on his back, butt scooting across the mat, kicking Ali in the shins until Ali could barely walk. Well, today we're talking about it. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then, we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, the extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no duh on the internet and to get to the juicy facts. Today's episode is all about fighting. We're going to discuss the evolution of the human body and ask the question, are humans designed to punch each other? And if humans are factory built to bust heads, why aren't we all as tough as Rocky? We'll also discuss how the match between Ali and Inoki went off the rails so spectacularly, and why it hasn't gone down in history as the fight of the millennia. Then we'll get into myths about fighting. Myths we see every day on TV, and we just accept as fact. Myth 1. Jocks are built for fighting and nerds are built for chess club. You're born to either stuff kids in other lockers or you're the one getting stuffed. It's all just genetic luck. Myth two, the millennial generation is weak and the generation after them will be weaker still. Worse yet, giving trophies to everyone will lead to a world of weaklings who don't know how to fight. Myth three, how do you actually win a fight, really? Is it strength? Is it training? Is there a universal philosophy to winning a street fight? But first, a warning. So, we're going to talk a lot about fighting today and how humans might actually be designed to punch each other uh, in the face. Uh, But we're all going to couple this with a a caveat. Do not go around picking fights. Uh, Just because your hands are built to be able to punch somebody does not mean you should. Uh, also, this may be one of the rare topics where both Todd and I have some experience with. Uh, not not punching people in the face, but um, I did uh, martial arts for years. Uh, I was in um, the ATA, the American Taekwondo Association, uh, which later I found out was practically useless for practical fighting purposes. Um, but then I did MMA and, and some uh, Israeli knife fighting, so with, with close supervision. So if you're going to punch anyone... Be supervised, be safe, do it in a closed environment. Um, And I eventually quit because I wanted to have functioning knees in my 60. Uh, And Todd has a bit of experience, too. I I boxed for 10 years, and I actually moved to Las Vegas to pursue a professional boxing career. So I worked with, I was able to train with and spar with some world champions, and and it rubbed elbows with them at the gym. The problem with picking fights with people is they hit back. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, I do have a saying that, I, that I've said. I think everyone in their life should be beat up by a non-sibling because it teaches you a little bit of fear and respect. And I think those are important, especially the fear one. 
Right. Suddenly you don't talk politics uh, out at public anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's not the same as being beat up by your brother. I promise. Right. Yeah. There, there's nor no is it by, mom. Nor is it being beat up by a professional boxer the same as getting in a fight at a bar. I promise <laughs> that too. <laughs> it's a little different. So uh, we we always end the show with with a joke, which is we don't know anything, but we have an opinion on everything. So this one is, we actually have a little bit of of experience with. Also, you may hear the sound of uh, kittens climbing uh, chairs and couches. So. Uh, for anyone that listened to our last episode and you heard a cat in the background, we talked about Todd's new kitten. Uh, we didn't smother it between episodes. That wasn't a prop. She's she's still wild. So. And terrorizing us. And terrorizing us. She knows a lot about fighting. She fights with my foot every day. That's right. Yeah, she's designed for dirty fighting, like all cats are. We also want to give uh, a tiny peek behind the curtain for how we select history stories. Uh, pretty much every episode we do, we select a bit of history to couple our science. Um, and, and this is a fight we're going to cover, uh, a historical fight. Todd, what makes this fight special? Why is this different than a, a normal story? Um, I think the big thing about it is that not, a lot of, not a lot of people, myself included, who's considered an expert in at least the history of boxing, I had never heard of this. And so we go for things that aren't the no doubt we've already heard. We always laugh about the Steve Jobs and the Chick Fil A and the Colonel Sanders. We look for stuff a little bit deeper. So even if it is right. a real famous person, Muhammad Ali at one time was the most famous person in the world. Yeah, he was known to be so, but not that many people know about this. He was literally called the greatest. Yeah. So and and I I thought I had heard about pretty much all of his fights. So when, when we both saw this, it was such an obscure thing. Like, why didn't anyone hear about the time Ollie almost lost a leg? And if he would have lost it at this time, we wouldn't know him as famous as he is today. Right. Um, one, one of the... Well, we'll get into the history, but it, it was just so strange to find an obscure fight like this that was so important. The, this is what interested me about it. Muhammad Ali being the best in boxing, but he had a love for all combat sports. He even went and got trained by... Um, June Ray, who is like the father of modern day Taekwondo, and he's well known to learn different f- forms of fighting. Hmm. Um, so, this was more of a promotional thing. It, it was entertaining, but it was a fight. And he had another one of these with uh, there was a football player named, this steroided up called Lyle Alzado. And everyone remembers him. He was an absolute psychopath on the field. They did a boxing match, which by now today's standards, Professional athletes of Muhammad Ali's caliber and worth are not going to go jumping in the boxing ring with right. <laughs> steroided up football players or these big wrestlers like this uh, this guy from Japan, 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 Inoki. Right. So, like that. That usually, if if two people who are from different disciplines jump in the ring, we're talking like potentially career-ending injury is usually why they don't. Well, absolutely, their, their worth is. But this was a different time. This was the seventies. Right. Um, they weren't monetized the way they work now with Instagram and Twitter and stuff. So he offered a million dollars to anybody that would go in the room, ring and fight him, a Japanese. And Inoki stepped up. Oh, okay. Well, good on him. I, that's something I don't think I could do. So anyone can throw a fist at anybody. You don't have to be a professional boxer to punch someone in the face, right? Right. Well, the the research I got into, uh, it, it said technically anyone can throw a fist. Um, now, I still disagree with that as, as a big nerd. Uh, I, I, I don't know about this as far as, like, could anyone throw a fist, but um, we're built to do it is what I, what I found. Uh, so this comes from the, uh, uh, the Journal of Evolutionary Biology. Uh, and the name of the article is a bit of a mouthful, but it's worth reading. I mean, really, really interesting. It's called Testing the Pugilism Hypothesis of Hominin Hand Evolution, uh, also known as the Metrics of Punching with a Buttress Fist. So do you, do you know what the term buttressed means? No. So um, there's an old castle term. A buttress, a, a, a buttress is a type of fortification. And it usually means there's, like, stacked stone with, with a, a stacked railing on top. Um, so if you look at your hand, just imagine stacked stone. That's what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking yeah. of rolls of hot dogs here is what I'm looking at. Right. You, you look like rolls of hot dogs. <laughs> it's like banana hands. A little heavier than my fighting days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I didn't mean heavy. I just mean the size of your hands. 
he, he makes that uh, that microphone look like a soda can. Um, but but the the buttress fist apparently is built to punch, and we're the only animal really built to do that. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna quote from this article real quick, and and whenever we quote from an article, we encourage people to go read it because we don't want to just take and not give back. So so read this article when you get a moment. Uh, quote. Our results suggest that humans can safely strike with 55% more force with a fully buttressed fist than with an unbuttressed fist, and with twofold more force with a buttressed fist than an open hand slap. Thus, the evolutionary significance of the proportions of hominin hand might be that these are the proportions that improved manual dexterity, while at the same time making it possible for the hand to be used as a club during fighting. So we're all born with these two clubs. We're born with clubs on the ends of our hands. Um, so to to sort of uh, uh, narrow this a little bit more, buttress fist means, but buttress meaning stacked. Um, so when you curl your hand into that fist uh, and your fingers slide into that sort of locked position in your palm and the, the bones line up in your hand and, and you're punching with those, those big top two knuckles, um, that's a maneuver other creatures can't do. So if you look at like chimps and gorillas are, are, are near sort of, uh, they're, they're built like us basically. When you watch them fight, they don't throw a punch. Like we, we talk about how, how strong they are. They're like six times the strength of a human. Or you talked to me, you showed me studies about that. They, they, they shred, they pull, right? Yeah. They yeah. pull your part and pull your body apart. <laughs> right. There's it's horrible. Th- there's a um, great article uh, about chimps going to war that I read once, and the way they, they kill each other is they will grab and rip and tear, and they if they bash with their fist, they slap down. They do sort of this hammer blow thing. Um, but humans are unique to punching. Like we, we, we push. We club. Right. Now, this study, the way they determine this, uh, I loved reading the study because it was so funny to me. Um, the way they found out the hand was built for this is they uh, slapped hands like they, they went and got cadaver arms and they put them on pendulums. So like they imagine going to the morgue <laughs> and being like, hey, you got some arms for us. Oh, We're going to throw them into weights, metal weights. Um, so they put these arms on pendulums and they repeatedly slammed them against weights. And they did it with arms that are curled like like buttressed fist. They did it with arms that were open, and they did it with arms that were just, like, crooked. And and they, of course, the arms that were not put into a fist, they shattered. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty fun Friday night, right? Yeah. I, I, this is the only time <laughs> I can saw. imagine. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a bunch of guys in lab coats just being like, throw a fist into it, like, <laughs> sitting around with, you know, beers or something. That's all in my mind. That's not actually how they did research, but... Uh, but yes, of course, they found out that a, a buttress fist, um, not only does that produce more power in a punch, the, the buttress fist, the, the closed fist, um, but it also protects the hand. And so that, that fist motion, uh, it, it makes the muscles around the bones basically tense up and it protects the bones, uh, which it doesn't do that for other creatures on Earth. Uh, so we are uniquely built to, to punch uh, specifically each other. Well, I brought to my mind a, a story that I remember, and I'll share it with you briefly. But I had a friend of mine, and he was he won the national rodeo. He was um, a champion, a, a bull rider. Mm-hmm. And I was out with him one night, and he was getting into an altercation, and he put his fist up, and I was so horrified by his form. I had to make about 20 adjustments. It's like, okay, this is how you fight. Your elbow's in, your fist up here, you turn your body. And I didn't realize until that fact that point <laughs> that there's not all punchers are the same right you really got to get the fundamentals down <laughs> right we, we might be able to make a fist but that does not necessarily mean and we again, can throw it correctly this was a man's man he rode bulls for a living so it wasn't <laughs> that he wasn't tough right it's just there's some form and some discipline in it too right of course <laughs> well we yeah uh, um one of the uh studies that came out after this buttress fist study uh, same authors. Uh, um, I'm gonna. Uh, the name of the guy that that led this study is David Carrier from University of Utah. Uh, he eventually went on to uh, write an article about how uh, male cheekbones and jaws might be designed to absorb a fist blow. So if you if you look at at, at the the cheekbones of a of a man, they're generally denser than women. So are the jaws, and the the way they sit in the face, they're for forward impact basically. 
And so if you if you compare this to like a football helmet, the way it's got that brace across the front, that's basically what our cheekbones are. So David Carrier, after the Buttress Fist article, came out and said, our faces might be designed to take a punch. Um, National Geographic uh, wasn't having it. They, they published a counter article that, that said this is nonsense. <laughs> um, and and that, one's, uh, that article is called Our Skulls Didn't Evolve to be Punched, very simply put. Um, so I, I actually side with David Carrier in this, but um, if you want to read both sides, you can. And that's, we like to bring up in this podcast where science might be disputed just because it's fun. Um, but regardless... Uh, this is why bare knuckle matches could go on for days compared to uh, a weighted glove match. Like there are um, uh, historical articles from like England where bare knuckle matches could go 30, 40 rounds or some ridiculous amount. And part of that is because our faces are possibly literally built to take a punch. Uh, of course, when you get into uh, modern boxing matches, how, how heavy are those gloves? They go from, they're usually eight ounce. Okay. And they're to protect your hand, not the person's face. Right. So when you get pummeled with that, it's not softening the blow like a and pillow. And they hit harder with those on. The, right. We're literally used to protect your hand. Okay. Yeah. Like when Mike Tyson got in a street fight one time, he broke both of his hands. Oh. Because, because you get so accustomed to your hands being wrapped. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> so so bare knuckle, we were literally built to do bare knuckle boxing. That's something I learned from my boxing days. It's when I got to be around the world champions. You, you, we always think it is like Rocky Balboa, and they're sweating and they're chopping wood. They're, it's it is not at all that exciting and that Hollywood. Okay, it's very deliberate. They're slowed down. They're very careful about the hands not getting broken because let's face it, if you break one of your hands and don't fight, you lose five million bucks. So. Yeah, that's your money maker. Right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They don't make a. a- uh, like a punching, like a slap sound when they punch. They make a cha-ching, cha-ching. That's the sound they make when they punch. And, and all hands aren't worth the same either. Right. My hands break and nobody cares. They don't wrap my hands that carefully. Right. If, if I break a hand, just like pennies fall on the floor. That's the sound it makes. Um, so I want to bring up real quick so we don't uh, get attacked online. There are a couple of rare instances where animals can punch. One of them, it's not with a buttress fist. There's an animal out there called a mantis shrimp. Todd, have you ever heard of a mantis shrimp? <laughs> no. Oh, this is going to be fun. I'm thinking okay, like so brine we, shrimp or something is what I'm thinking of. Oh, you're, you're going to be delighted by this. We're going we're gonna to pause the podcast real quick, and I'm going to make... Um, first off, I'd recommend everybody who is in line of sight of YouTube go online and look up something called the mantis shrimp, and there are YouTube videos of them punching things. And so I'm going to make Todd watch one of these, and then we'll get back to you, and we'll explain what's happening in these videos. Okay, so we just saw um, a slow-mo video of the mantis shrimp, the punchers, because they have bowling ball hands. So what, what does that look like? Well, it's a, for, for starters, it's a good-looking shrimp. It's a good-looking... <laughs> it's very it's handsome. Got this, it is. It's got this blue tail. It's a gorgeous water creature. And it's got these two... That I guess you would call them like... It looks like a... Um, fist, right, and it's throwing what can only be described as a vicious uppercut. That's a good. That's a good way to describe it. At the and they say that it's as powerful as a twenty-two caliber gun underwater. Right. So this this thing is designed to punch. Um, the owner of this said his boss had one and it split his finger. It hit his finger. This tiny little shrimp and split it to the bone. Yeah. They're, the the biggest they get, I think, is basically the length of your forearm. So, like, they don't get much bigger than a crawdad. It just crushes big shells. So that's what it's used for is to, to, to kill and get food, to just crush through other shellfish and get them and eat them. Right. We, we didn't watch too many videos. We just watched one. But you can watch videos of them bullying octopi. Like, they'll go after huge animals, and they're tiny comparatively. It's so powerful and so fast. They have to use a special kind of camera to slow. It's imp- it's worth seeing. It's it's something else you've never yeah. seen anything like. I know I never have. They're they're <laughs> impressive. Uh, and one of the one of the ones they talked about is uh, they said at its fastest, it can create something called a cavitation bubble, uh, which which means that um, water when they hit through the water, water actually uh, compresses and they they drive the air from the water and they create a bubble. And these bubbles hit with such force that, um, or the hands hit with such force in these bubbles that it creates light and heat. 
And I'm going to quote uh, a YouTuber named Zafrank. He said, this is some Mortal Kombat finishing move stuff. Like, this is, like, so unreal, the speed they punch at. Um, but I will point out, that's not a buttressed fist. That, 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 that despite this being an animal that can throw a punch, it, it doesn't have a hand, quote-unquote. It has uh, basically a bone uh, uh, orb at the end of an arm. So that's not technically a hand or technically a punch. It's like but a it pod, is, a power pod. It's a power pod, yeah. That's, <laughs> that sounds like something we'd sell. I'm going to sell a power pod. We could fight these things like they do down in, in right. some countries. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh! You can look at videos of them fighting <laughs> mantis shrimp. I got, I got seventy bucks on the. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the rest of our the podcast one from Australia. From now on. <laughs> uh, our podcasts are now just mantis shrimp fights. Uh, but yeah, you, there's so many videos of of these little badasses uh, doing their thing underwater. Um, so, so the last thing I want to cover, and this is really just sort of a, a theory that is shared. The the, the facts of how our fists are built are pretty much undisputed, especially after these studies. Um, but one of the things that evolutionary scientists still talk about, still argue about, is why. Why are our fists built to punch? Um, is it to defend against other animals? Because we use spears, right? Like, we don't technically need to use our fists. Usually we're attacking other animals with, like, bows and spears and things. And, I mean, we... we Running hunter theory is about us running down game, or at least mm-hmm. carry on and scatter um, scavenge think, material. I can't think of any animal we can take down with our fists. Just other people, right? So <laughs> that is that is actually the. Uh, I think it's one of the more popular theories online about why we're built to punch. It's, it's a genocide kind of thing. Not not genocide. It's um, uh, fireside competition for mates. Oh. So basically us... I'm a better protector, but we don't want to kill anybody. We still need everybody. Exactly. So it's kind of like our version of deer antlers. Deer will, will fight each other with their antlers, but they're not trying to kill. They're just trying to maim and, and wound and like scare other deer off. And leave my lady alone. Exactly. She's mine. Yeah. So we got these hands that can punch each other without damaging our, our fists while also you know ringing somebody's bell, making them think twice about coming near us. Uh, so that's that's the the one of the more popular ideas, and and of course that's the one I side with. I I kind of like that. Do men still do that? Do we still fight over women, or is that that thing since the that's just the in internet. movie? <laughs> yeah, just in movies. Yeah, I think now with Match and Harmony and everything, <laughs> we don't do that anymore. That's just the movie Roadhouse. No other no other movies even. Just but that we one. used to. Yeah, we used to. <laughs> So, do you mind uh, uh, telling us why the match versus Anoki was so strange? Because because when I think of a wrestler versus a boxer, I always think, you know, it, it, the, the wrestler's just going to get punched out, right? Or if he gets too close, maybe then he'll be able to grapple or something? This is the issue about this. Okay, Ali, as being a tough guy as he was, he saw how Inoki could kick. Inoki could really kick, and he didn't want anything to do with that. So the rules were, and then Inoki, on the other hand, knows it's Muhammad Ali. He doesn't want to have anything to do with his punches. Right. So they were the wrong. They didn't believe in their own discipline enough not to make the rules. So Ali's rules were, um, he he wasn't allowed to get kicked by Inoki. <laughs> Inoki wasn't. If as long as he was down on the ground, Ali couldn't punch him. Okay. So they set it up to kind of be a dud from the from the jump. Like you can't do your greatest attack, and I won't do my greatest attack. Right. So are they just going to breathe on each other? Like how are they going to win? Well, they're 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 going to try to use their. Inoki decided that he was going to slide around on his on it and just kind of up kick, which up kick means kind of protect yourself like you're being you're being attacked from up above. So it's just chipping away at it. So it wasn't an offensive, it was just a defensive strategy. So it made for a pretty boring pay per view event. So he was when you said butt slide, he was literally sliding on his button back around the ring. Yes, and kicking at his shins. That's dirty. Well it it was yeah, it was, it seems silly. Nobody knew what they were <laughs> watching. You gotta remember this is in a big stadium and everything and this was right. a, Pre now, if you watch some some MMA today, it's pretty common. Yeah. So they were ahead of their time. They just neither one really wanted to engage. I call it a gentleman's agreement. You know, okay. don't punch me in the face. I won't punch you in the <laughs> face. <laughs> you know, you get a million bucks. I get a million bucks. So was was Anoki originally supposed to wrestle? Like, was he going to like grapple or something? Right. Oh, he was supposed okay. to grapple, use his wrestling, and if he would have taken that approach, he probably would have won. All he had to do was pin Ali. 
for three to hold him down. And a guy who had his level of pro- he's a beast of a man, would probably would have had no problems. Right. So when they started doing this, how when when one was butt scooting across the ring and Ollie wasn't throwing punches, how did the crowd take it? They were confused. <laughs> <laughs> they were annoyed, and so Ali went to taunting him and doing what he does. So, yeah, there's a reason we haven't all heard about this. Okay, so it's not because it was so popular nobody talked about it ever again. It's it's no, but they had the right idea, and as a big fan of MMA and and, and I took jujitsu for a couple of years. If they both would have engaged, it would have been a lot different. It, it, it might have changed. Wrestling wasn't seen. Wrestling was seen as just uh, entertainment. It wasn't seen as a real sport, even on the Olympic level. Even the people who were the real good ones, and it could have really gotten MMA started a lot earlier. Okay. And showed value in the, in the trade discipline of that boxers weren't just the toughs. Now, keep in mind, boxing is not as popular as it used to be. Non-sports people were, when Mama Holly fought, the whole world stopped and watched. It was a huge deal. Everyone wanted either Fraser or Ali to win. Right. And so every, by, the, by the time this happened, it was really kind of their prime? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Was, this was definitely the golden age of boxing. Oh, okay. So th- this is just a, a weird question for for MMA. So this this wasn't like a proof of a successful fight. This was more like them shaking out the kinks on the world stage. Yes, absolutely. And and then everyone was involved in. There's some things that I'll share with you later. I want to do a spoiler that came out of this that are the reason we will have MMA is is actually bigger. It's become bigger than boxing today. And oh, some okay. of it started because of this. Oh, cool. Gotcha. Well, that that's a good teaser. So it wasn't a total waste of time. Yeah. So I, I, I like that you asked, you know, do we still, like, are we actually still punching each other? Is that how we still solve our issues? Yes. <laughs> one, of the, one of the discussions we want to have on today's podcast is, uh, are kids getting weaker? Um, so there there's an idea that, like, um, uh, as we as we go through the generations, like I I hear this a lot from like sort of uh, the factory generation, the greatest generation, or, or sometimes even boomers. I hear them say this, uh, that, that kids are getting softer. Um, There is a, uh, a study that came out in 2016 uh, called it's from the journal of hand therapy. And I I had never heard of this journal, but um, by God, I heard a lot from this study because it was published in USA today and it, it was put out on CNN and Fox and everything. Everyone wanted to cover this because they're like, it's true, kids are getting weak. Uh, and it, it, the study came out from the Journal of Hand Therapy that um, the grip strength in millennials had been lower. That they, they tested millennials and it was, um, I was like 20% weaker or something like that. Less climbing trees, less laborious jobs, more computer stuff, right? That's right. It. it after some more rigorous study, like initially this came out like a bomb, like every news agency was like, see, kids are really weak. Like, like it's, it's proving that millennials are worthless. Like, <laughs> Couldn't find a callus on one of them. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, come to find out, it, it just is because your average person is weaker, not just millennials. It, it's it's anyone that hasn't worked a factory job or, or manned a, a shovel in their life. They're, nobody... So you, you so can't, the parents that are calling them weak are the exact same thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah the, the, the parents that are working office jobs now who have stopped using a shovel for 20 years. It's. Well, I always roll my eyes because I'll, someone my age will say, these kids nowadays, like, like we weren't lazy. Like, we, didn't, we weren't. <laughs> right. There, there were no losers or lazy people we're around. That ain't true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, when, when, yeah like there weren't a, a, even adults that were, like, <laughs> you know, passing the, the buck on to somebody else. I just I just remember like um, uh, meeting old guys when I was living in Eastern Oregon, like 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 I had a uh, my grandpa his his hands were like can openers, like he never got weaker as he aged. Like he could just tear open a tuna can if he wanted. <laughs> they 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 shake your hand for fun because they just want to they make yes. you feel weak. They squeeze your hand. Yeah, that right. used to be a thing old guys used to do. Remember that I used to break your yeah, hand. Yeah, it, it sounded like, like child abuse nowadays. Right? Yeah, it sounded like. <laughs> They'd shake your hand. It would sound like they're crushing a pine cone. Like it. <laughs> I remember my grandfather would grab me and sh- and and comb my hair violently <laughs> and laugh at me. You know what I mean? your hair. Yeah, like, just, just yeah. in a real violent, like rough. Yeah, right. Just, you yeah, can feel your yeah. scalp pulling back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, good news, uh, um, kids. We, we may have millennials who haven't manned a shovel or, or had to move anything for a while, but generally humans have been domesticated. So good news, bad news. It's, it's we're not a weaker generation. It's uh, humans are domesticated. So this, this, is, um, this is sort of the, the bigger picture kind of thing. Like when, when we talk science on the show, usually we're disproving a very specific point. This really is more like an overall, uh, this is why humans are, are not vicious predators. Um, there, there are, um, uh, once in a while I'll run into things online where, where guys will, usually it's guys, I, I, I almost always it's men posting, but I'll see somebody's Facebook from one of my friends who are like still gym rats, and they'll piss pictures of like uh, uh, angry wolves, and it'll say something like be the alpha or... Yeah. Or some motivational crap about how you know you yeah. become primal again or something. Yeah, wolves don't care about the opinions of sheep, kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, I've heard that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like that one. Like they're just such. Yeah, I know. Yeah, time. yeah. My meathead, my knucklehead buddies do that too. Like yeah, that. I, I think everyone that has those those knucklehead buddies, they <laughs> that they see those. That's yeah. It's the well. It turns out um, they're they're just as domesticated as we are, <laughs> or or me, the nerd. It's. Um, so we're going to get into what domestication means. Uh, when I say domesticated, um, if you want to look this up, it's called self-domestication theory. Uh, and there's a great Science Mag article called Early Humans Domesticated Themselves, uh, New Genetic Evidence Suggests. So to, to clarify what domestication means, uh, usually it means that uh, a creature has been socialized, like it's, it's been bred and, and selected throughout generations to be more social than it is aggressive. So that's what domestication means in this context. It means that uh, uh, for thousands of years, uh, the, the females and males of our species have gotten together not because they were more aggressive, because they were better at picking nits off each other's backs and, and talking around the fire. Um, there's a great uh, study uh, that was done. Uh, it's called the Belyave uh, Red Fox Domestication Process, uh, and this was um, our, our basically our first clue that domestication was a rapid process, and, and it, it kind of proved what it does. So um, it was a, a Russian scientist uh, around World War II. Um, he was not allowed to uh, study domestication. So he, he had a fox farm. Ostensibly, he, he basically told everybody, I'm raising foxes for coats. Like, he, he wanted the fur. Um, what he ended up doing is proving that within 10 generations, he would go and feed foxes, these foxes that he was supposed to be raising for fur, and he would, um, he would give them food, and he would raise them, and he'd slaughter them, but he would keep the foxes that showed less fear. So the, the fearful foxes are the, 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 they're the more wild foxes. They, they were the ones that were growling and snapping at him. And he would turn them into coats. Uh, and the ones that were uh, more social, the ones that would actually come up and sniff his finger, he would keep them. And over the course of about 10 fox generations, he, he bred them to be domestic. And there are, there are delightful videos. These farms still exist. You can watch videos of them feeding domestic foxes. And they're cute as buttons. Like, uh, it almost made me want to get a red fox from Russia. Um, but the most notable part, uh, what happens to these foxes, their, their tendons get shorter in places, their ears get floppier, their teeth get smaller. Like, they, they go through a physical transformation because they lack the hormones of a wild animal. Because they're not using those things. Because they're not using those things. Um, surprise, surprise, humans already have all of these domesticated traits. We already have the floppy lack of cartilage ears. We already have the shorter teeth. We already have, and, and we, we know this because we can look back at um, early humans, Neanderthals, and Denisovians who split off from us 600,000 years ago. Um, so our best scientific guess, we humans started domesticating ourselves um, approximately 25,000 uh, 25, to 40,000 years ago. Uh, and, and the idea is that um, we did it specifically because we were winning. That, that humans, there's, um, I think it's uh, most Northern Europeans have Neanderthal in their DNA. I found out I'm like, I'm 3% Neanderthal or something. <laughs> so I'm sure it's um, not higher than that? <laughs> it might be a little bit higher. Yeah. It, it's quite high, but, but it's usually a, a percentage. Knuckle dragger. Yeah. <laughs> 
I, I used a, um, a, a I, I refused to get a car today to come over because it had wheels on it, and that to me is witchcraft. <laughs> but uh, the idea is um, we, we lack the big brow ridge that they had. We, we lack the, the pointy ears. We lack a lot of the things that would normally show you know, undomesticated human. So now what all this tells me is that... Um, we didn't win as a species by being stronger and faster than Neanderthals or Denisovians. What we did is we out-socialized them. So our, our self-domestication, it worked. We won by self-domesticating. Well, the thing that's popped up when you were talking about this, going over this research with me, was I used to volunteer at the Humane Society. we take classes, and they'd explain to us about animals. And cats, if they get out, they can. They have a lot of their they survival skills. They can survive, and survival is even socializing, getting food from the neighbors or from other places. Right. Dogs have had. They have zero percent, Joe. If they don't have an owner, they pat. They perish. Oh Nowhere wow. On the street, they have none because it's been just like the foxes. It's been bred out of them. Oh, that makes sense. They like wolves have the pointed ears, the long teeth, all that. Dogs, I mean, like poodles. But, or, or just even like a mutt, they got floppy ears, they lack cartilage, their teeth are shorter. So yeah, like us, that makes perfect sense. Or even the wits to go after, the wits or the will to, to kill and eat. You know? Right. Yeah, any dog I've owned, if they if they catch another animal, they're playing. It's not vicious. Well, that's a really good point. Thank you. So because you're familiar with um, MMA, uh, in your opinion... Because you you know the rules that we currently use. How should the fight between Ali and Inoke should have been fought? How should they have set that up? I boxed for 10 years, and I did took uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for two years. And within three weeks of my first class, and I boxed for 10, and I started Jiu-Jitsu. I learned more about fighting in three weeks of Jiu-Jitsu than in 10 years <laughs> of boxing. And I knew right away that if a boxer does not know how to wrestle or, or grapple, they're done. They, all they have is one chance of a punch. And the, the, even the best fighters in the world, the chance of, of you land a punch on a wrestler who knows what they're doing coming in, you're in trouble. So I think if Inoki would have just throw caution in the wind and wrestled him, oh. he, he would have murdered him. And, and then all this press would have come to, can wrestlers, are they tougher than boxers? Right. And then it would evolve later that the boxers would have to learn like they have in MMA. Even the best strikers have to learn how to at least be competent at stopping getting taken down. So, which they, means they have to train. Okay, so you think Anoki would have shot in and, and, you know, if he had absorbed a blow or two, he could have gotten Ali on his back? Absolutely. Okay. And Ali was not a hard puncher. He was a quick, he was more quick than he was powerful. So he's not a guy that's going to one punch you anyways. So he he had, he would have won easily. He would have just ragdolled him around the ring. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So... Here's the part where um, this isn't so much science because there wasn't any science on this, but you and I are going to discuss, uh, after watching this this hilarious YouTube video of the butt scooting, um, I want to ask you how to win a fight. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll set us up with some rules first. Uh, um, first off, we're, we're going to do a hypothetical fight. This is, uh, um, we're, we're in a street fight. Um, oh, oh, actually, uh, you pick like a mall because malls are kind of going out of style. So, like, like <laughs> pick a pick a mall, uh, uh, like Mall of America or something. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so um, think of a mall, and uh, we'll be in the food court. Okay. And uh, a guy your exact size and weight, um, carrying a a popcorn bucket, walks out of 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 the food court. <laughs> Runs into you, spills his popcorn, and blames you. What is the goal of the fight? So when when you guys like you know say he's not backing down, what is the goal of the fight, and and how do you win? Well, the goal of the fight probably is to scare him away first of all and act tougher than you ever see when men do that. They start talking about, do you know who I am? Do you know who yeah. I am? <laughs> like like they're Mike Tyson or something. Right, right. It always I, makes me laugh. <laughs> That's my that's my go to is I I ask them do you know who I am and then I, I when they say no I say no too I'm like I don't either please help me. <laughs> well, the very first thing is is guard up and that is that is your fist on your cheeks okay. and that's for one reason is you can cover your face like like a football helmet and second you're in, you're as close as striking so you can turn your body and hit them 
And the very first thing is to hit them before that they know they're in their fight. Okay. So I guess the gentleman thing is for each to set go, but in real life, the person who hits first usually wins. Okay. Hits and lands and connects first usually wins. So, so it's usually about the initial stun, the initial, mm-hmm. the initial ringing somebody's bell, and then you find out if the other person really wanted to fight or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, once that initial hit goes over. Yeah. I remember um, this has not come from a fighting class, so this is uh, you tell me if it's good advice or not. Um, I remember taking a, a master class online from a, a screenwriter, and he said um, he was trying to learn how to fight in one day. Like he was just asking, like a, a martial arts expert. He's like, "How do I win a fight? How do I write about this accurately?" Uh, and and he said that um, the, the the instructor said, "Well, stand here," and he's like ten feet away. He's like, "Can I hit you from there?" And, and the guy's like, no, of course not. And he's like, okay, take three steps forward. Can I hit you from here? And he's like, no, of course not. And then, like, he, he, he finally gets into, like, you know, two, three feet from him. And he's like, can I hit you from here? He's like, yeah. He's like, okay, now take another step forward. Like, hug me. Can I hit you from here? He's like, no. And so, so he's like, there you go. That's how to fight. Just don't be in that two-foot range <laughs> where that's I could fair. punch you. And that's very true. And that's what the really good uh, strikers have. They, we call it being in pocket. And what that is is, in where, pocket. Yeah, is where you can hit them and they can hit you. So you have to get in there and hit them and get back out. So that's And that takes a long time to learn the timing and the space. And then you have to feint because you want to go into that pocket and not get – because you, there's a lot of – you're in a lot of uh, – you're very vulnerable when you're going into it. Because, okay. Because you're forced of jumping into that pocket and them coming at you. Um, so And you can never tell who is trained and who isn't. Okay. It really is more about fundamentals and skills than it is about who's tougher. <laughs> tougher doesn't really have any value whatsoever. <laughs> oh, okay. Reps and discipline do, though. Right. And there really is no substitute for sparring, of really getting hit and seeing how you... It's counterintuitive. Yeah. Our, our hearts and our minds say, get out of here. Yeah. You almost have to pride and will your, your way to, you know... To Todd, Todd and I have never talked about um, our fighting experience so much. Like we've we've talked about the subject of. So, what was your first instinct when you when you first got punched a couple times? Well, I think about sparring. I think I'd done some kind of mental damage to me going after school every every day, and then and when I got older as an adult, going to the gym and getting in in flight or fright times all the time. Yeah. Which is what you are. You're, you are fighting. And it is training, but sometimes it's brawling and sometimes it gets out of hand. And when you're an amateur boxer, you have to fight with people that are smaller than you. And that's a problem because they're so fast. Right. And then, Or you fight bigger guys who knock your block off. If you make one mistake, <laughs> you're, right. it's lights out. So. so my hypothetical where you're fighting somebody your exact size and weight, that doesn't happen very often? And your same skill level? Unlikely. Either they're so new that you don't want to hurt them, or they're so experienced that they kill you. Okay. So, my my first sparring experiences, I say that plural because I did it multiple times. I found out that there's this middle step between fight and and flight, which is uh, freeze up and act dumb. That was mine. Is I it took me a lot of sparring sessions before I stopped freezing up. The third thing that I think is really important is just conditioning. Yeah. No matter how uh, we have a, a saying in boxing that says fatigue makes coward of men. Hmm. And you just can't fight when you're you're empty. So when <laughs> you get yeah. gassed out, you yeah, make you're done. You're, you're done. You're a, you are a punching bag. You're a flesh <laughs> punching bag. And it happens sometimes. Sometimes you get so excited and so nervous that it happens before you're actually tired. It's just your adrenaline's gone and you're done. Right. You're easy pickings at that point. So. When uh, when I set up the episodes, usually I will ask friends or family uh, what they want to know. Like, what what if they were the listener, what would they want to know from this? Uh, over and over again, my friend said, uh, how do I win a fight? So instead of us saying how to win a fight, because our, our advice is what, what I just heard from us talking, don't get in a fight, don't stand in the pocket, stay away from fists, basically, and then finally train which are none of those are answers that my friends wanted to hear they wanted to hear dominate the center ring you know like a execute you know punch like they, they wanted to hear fun things so we're, we're very boring on this show but and the reality is, is, is no one wins a fight so if you win you win you broke your hand you <laughs> right. go to jail 
and you're a felon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's if you win. <laughs> if you lose, you're in the hospital. That is a very good point. You brought me to a really nice point, which is um, uh, in all but a couple of states, fighting is always a felony. Um, so there is a, a law called, uh, it, it exists in the U.S., it used to exist in more states, called mutual combat. Uh, what this means is that if you wanted to get in a fist fight, um, there are now only two states where you can do this legally. Uh, it requires a peace officer. So if you go to these states, don't start picking fist fights. You literally have to hail down a cop and ask somebody to, to supervise you getting in a fight with someone. It's called mutual combat. You can look that up. Actually, you can watch YouTube videos of people getting into mutual combat. It's funny because no one's ever good at fighting. Um, so uh, there's only two states that allow that. Everywhere else, all other circumstances are felonies. So just don't. It's not worth it. Um, and, and the very last thing I want to look at, just for fun, just, just for my sake, actually. Um, do you see a link in that doc called How to Win a Fight? The, the wiki how? I see. <laughs> in under 30 seconds, yeah. Yeah, go ahead and click that. <laughs> Um, for anybody who isn't familiar with WikiHow, WikiHow is a website that gives you uh, fun little like cartoon pictures, and it usually explains stuff like WikiHow of how to make tie dye shirts, or WikiHow of how to how to iron something, or WikiHow on how to build a table. I found a WikiHow <laughs> on how to win a fight. This is very corny. It's like this cartoon uh, after school special. <laughs> it is so corny. This is terrible. Yeah. Um, we're only going to read the headlines while you look at the pictures. The first one is, uh, take a few seconds to evaluate the situation. And it shows these two cartoon characters glaring at each other. Uh, and then de-escalate the danger. And you're right, it, it does remind me of like a school, sort of like like uh, a cheap high school cartoon. Not Whoever did these animation, I'm not bagging on you specifically, but... Uh, uh, be wary of unpredictable components in the cartoon shows, you know, mental anguish or, or alcohol. Uh, exploiting your opponent's weaknesses is listed as method two, and it just shows them throwing these wild haymakers. <laughs> okay, so do you see the, the, the picture where he's got him bent over and he's like going for a grab, like the guy with the, the white t-shirt? So yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the wrestling, that's the double leg. Yeah, I know that one. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so would you recommend this wiki how for anyone that wants to win a real fight? I would practice some of these things. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't just read this and then and then square up. <laughs> right. It's kind of like something there's some things that you you have you can't learn in a book. Let's put it that way. I'm going to go the opposite because I, I want to punish our listeners for even tuning in. Uh, you don't even need to read. The, just give me your phone before you get in a fight. Do that thing where, like, people, you ask somebody a question at dinner or at a bar, and they, like, pop open a wiki on their phone. And like, yeah, I know about that. Just that with fighting. Just do that. Joe likes the links more than I do. But this this show with the fighting shrimp and this, these are all worth. This is just good stuff to laugh <laughs> at. This is very entertainment value. Right. Joe tells me something. I just believe him. He has to show me 15 different evidence on it. But <laughs> I, I provide as much source as possible so that we, we... So when people come and argue with us, which that'll happen, it'll, it'll be against our sources. So we're, we're kind of coming to the, the, the end of the fight, so to speak. So um, could you tell us, please, how, how Ollie's great fight against the wrestler went and, and why haven't we heard of this? Well... Ali had a lot of leg damage, and if he wouldn't have made adjustments, his corner saw that he was getting kicked, and he was in pain, and he complained about it, but he wasn't going to quit. If they wouldn't have made adjustments, he would have lost his leg. He was getting blood clots, and not just lost his leg, there was a good chance he would have lost his life. So he, he was, he was uh, facing either amputated leg or death after this. Holy cow. So... The crowd was booing because they thought this was boring. They're, they're watching a guy scoot across the ring kicking, and they're watching another guy basically run backward trying not to punch him in the head. But they didn't know what they were watching because this was the first thing ever. Oh, wow. So, so they didn't, yeah. So to be fair. They're bored, and Ollie is getting career-ending blood clots. Yeah. Wow. So that's the difference about being who, who really won the fight. They, they both can it was kind of a black eye for both of them uh, coming out of this. Now, the, what really came out of this, um, we talked about earlier, a spoiler, was 
there was a referee for it who was a famous martial artist. His name is Gene LaBelle. Now, I know about this guy. I have watched documentaries on him. He has he's trained he trained Bruce Lee how to grapple. He's worked he's worked in thousands of movies. He's a Hollywood guy, so he's a he's a world class grappler. He also taught um, recently R- uh, Ronda R- Rousey, who was the women's champion and one of the most famous MMA fighters in the world. Oh, so he's still an active trainer then. He is, and he's one of those eighty year old guys who's still super fit with the cauliflower ears. It looks like he could kick your ass at eighty. Right. <laughs> he's one of those kind of guys. That, he's got just got that energy. He's like my grandpa. He crushes hands when he goes to, to shoot. Yeah, and he's got that California tea. He's a cool cat. I mean, he's been on <laughs> all these movies, met all these movie stars. He was the original referee for that. So he is the godfather of, of grappling. So he literally saw the birth of MMA. He did. Wow. So That's so he, amazing. Yeah. So in the end, you said it was a black eye for both of them. Who, who technically won? Technically, it was a draw, which means they both won and they both lost. Okay. But really, uh, Muhammad Ali was pissed. He, he, This guy just scooted around in his butt, kicked him in the leg. He wasn't happy. He said, that's not fighting. And the Japanese fighter was shamed in front of his people. They got only a percentage of their purse. Muhammad Ali is supposed to be the greatest fighter in the world. He wanted to just wipe the floor with this guy. Right. So all the fans <laughs> and both <laughs> fighters and both camps were all losers. So that's why we've never heard of this, because everyone was upset afterward. It's not a happy ending. Yeah, well, you, it's hard to get toys and promotional posters if everyone's disappointed. See, I would buy that. Can we get our hands on one of those? That would go good with my uh, Tour de France poster. <laughs> oh, no, I would I would hang a poster of, of... I would hang it when he's butt scooting or, like, doing <laughs> his flying kicks. I would have that poster. They're not as popular as the, the Ollie with his arm up screaming at the mat, like, when he knocks... Yeah, there, there's not one of the top ten Ollie posters, but I would <laughs> hang it. That means I can get it cheap then, right? That's yeah, exactly. Means. We can order it for cheap. <laughs> Fighting isn't just a last resort. If you're conscious of your surroundings and you're considerate of the people around you, fighting should never be a resort at all. However, if you find yourself balling your fist into a buttress fist out of anger, remember, as a human, you may be built for punching, but you're emotionally equipped to find a better solution. Like a chihuahua who bares his teeth in anger, or a kitten hissing at its owner, you might be built to punch but you've also been domesticated by tens of thousands of years of living in society. When the frat boy with the popped up polo collar shoulder checks you at the bar, you may feel like you're built to tussle, but so is a puppy. Lastly, if you ever found yourself in a physical altercation, remember that it's always a way out if you keep looking for it. Confusion, misdirection, and awareness are your best tools. Simple bodily distancing can get you out of a lot of physical and financial pain. And if none of those techniques work, you can always try to butt scoot at them and kick them in the shins until they give up. You've been listening to The Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com where we have research links, show notes, and blog articles for each of our episodes. We also appreciate feedback, and we love spirited debates and fist fights. Why not? <laughs> We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. Mm-hmm.